God, we thank you for an opportunity and a space to come and worship you, Lord. Lord, to make you the God of our lives, to recognize you and your work amongst us, and Lord, to be your hands and feet as the hope of the world, your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the traditional service at Blackwater United Methodist Church. We're glad you're here. And we are going to now join our voices as we are called to worship God this morning. Please join me in saying our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. <clears throat> and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Peace this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to ask you to return to your seat, if you will, and I'm going to share some ways that we can be in life with each other this week and in ministry. So, first of all, 
Did anybody smell that delicious pastelaya brewing out there in the parking lot? Mmm. <laughs> so uh, just wanted you to know that we have pastelaya plate lunches available right after this service, beginning at 10 o'clock, all the way until 2 o'clock today. And so we have a truck set up over in front of the uh, fellowship hall, and y'all can go over there and get your pastelaya plate lunches for $10. That is a fundraiser for our pilgrims who are going to the Holy Land. Also, uh, you can stay after the third service and eat those with us in the fellowship hall, and then we're going to kick into our final Holy Land, Discovering the Holy Land Bible study uh, shortly after. That's been great. We've had a wonderful turnout and a great time in there, and so you don't have to be going on the trip to do that. Just come eat with us and spend time together. It's be wonderful. We've got all kinds of small groups starting. Unoffendable is going to start on Sundays from 4 to 6. That's led by Camille and Suzanne uh, Robertson. And uh, so we're very grateful for them. That's going to be a neat, but that's, they've got four slots available, and that starts September 10th on Sundays. Also, we have a ladies Bible study on Ruth. That's going to be starting on Tuesdays from 9 to 11, beginning September 12th. And then Ian and I are going to be hosting The Chosen on Thursday nights, which is a potluck dinner, a viewing of the episodes of Chosen, and a discussion about that. September 8th is a tailgate cook-off. Listen, we got our fall calendar rolling. You can hear it, right? We got our tailgate cook-off. That's going to be fun. All of you who, who uh, love to cook and like to talk smack, that is a great event for you. Uh, we're going to have a barbecue contest. We're going to have a fixin's contest. I asked somebody here, what's a fixin'? They said, Pastor, where are you from? It's a side. I said, okay, side items, uh, dessert and appetizer contest. So uh, those are going to have rewards. You do not want to, to not win an award at that tailgate. Let me just tell you, I know what the prize is. You want to win, trust me. Um, so I'll just, I'll put that out there. Um, also, we have a garage sale coming up. If you're, it's a time to do some fall cleaning before uh, you're ready to go ahead and you're going to drop those off the last week of September and we're going to have a uh, wonderful garage sale uh, and get rid of some of that stuff and help folks go to the Holy Land with that. we got a lot happening. You've got a new newsletter out today. Make sure you grab one of those and, uh, and uh, we'll enjoy that. Now as we come to our time where we receive an offering, I remind you that we do that here at Blackwater in five ways. We offer our prayers. So I'd ask that you would have the Lord search your heart for somebody who needs prayer today. There are many, there are many that need prayer. I ask that you would consider your presence, being undistracted here while we worship together. Put those cell phones down, turn them off. Focus your mind and your heart on God and the word that's presented today. Be present with us. Thank you for those joining on online for the ways that you're being present with us as well. Ask that you would consider your gifts. Somebody hit me up with an envelope and a candy bar attached to it this morning. They were about this tall and cute as could be. I can't resist. That's our children. Our children right now are over there learning Bible verses. And I can't tell you how much it warms my heart for my daughter to come in and almost have them all. She's got the books of the Bible almost memorized, and I'm very excited about our children's ministry, pouring that into our children. Also, how your gifts might also touch other people in the lives of this church. We have ministry that goes on in Angola on death row. We have ministry that goes on in small groups where we disciple and learn about God's word and its relevance to our lives today. That's what your gifts go to support. We try to make an impact in our community as well. And also for your witness, the things that God is doing in your lives and your service, being willing to be the hands and feet of Christ. These are our offerings. What would you give to the Lord that the Lord might multiply and be part and participate in God's reconciliation for the world? Let's pray. God, thank you for the way that you'll move across the hearts of your people. May your Holy Spirit compel, Lord, prayers, attention, gifts, service, and witness. May we put our hearts on the altar this morning for you, and may you take and receive that offering, God, and multiply it 
And may we be a tremendous part of bringing healing to your world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. happy to be here. <laughs> I, um, I'm struggling with like the hustle and bustle of back to school and falling into all these new routines. I find myself going through the motions and checking everything off the list and then forgetting some things for the kids and then rushing to get them done. And <sighs> life's busy as a mom, a wife, and a business owner. I heard the other day something along the lines of, you can give an hour, an hour to God every week and pour that into your children, and they will know the never ending of love of Christ as well as the comfort that comes with that. So, church is a weekly priority above all else. After last week's sermon, 
I'd like to pray to be more engaged in our daily lives and not just going through the motions of things that keep you from staying spiritually important moments. So I came across this scripture, which I'm sure you all know, but <laughs> um, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. The devil would like nothing more than to keep us from the moments when we are seeking God's face and developing and maintaining meaningful, meaningful relationships and serving his kingdom. Amen. Please join me in saying the Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever. Amen. reading scripture to us today. It is in Daniel chapter 6 verses 19 through 28. Then at dawn the king got up and at first light hurried to the den of the lions. When he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out anxiously to Daniel, O oh Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you faithfully serve been able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel said to the king, O oh king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt me, because I was found blameless before him. Also before you, O king, I have done no wrong. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The king gave a command, and those who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the den of the lions. They, 
their children, and their wives. Before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all of their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples and nations of every language throughout the whole world, may you have abundant prosperity. I make a decree that all in my royal dominion people shall tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion has no end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this, Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and of the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Throughout my sermon series, I have shared with you many of my experiences from the Masai Mara in Kenya, Africa. One more story I have is when my group and I set out in a safari vehicle. This is kind of an all-terrain vehicle. And we were traveling through a really bumpy and very challenging and dense part of the jungle. And as we navigated through the rough terrain, we came across a clearing, and I will always remember the sight of a majestic lion. It was gracefully resting under a tree, shading itself through the towering tree over it. And, and we froze in that moment as a group in complete awe and very quiet for us, very silent. We were just captivated by the raw power that that, that that animal exuded in that moment. And as we looked at that magnificent creature, we noticed something that was quite intriguing. We looked at it and the lion seemed completely unperturbed by the surrounding chaos of the jungle. There were the chirping birds, there was this constant rustling of leaves and other creatures running around, the presence of us and our vehicle. And yet that lion remained there serene and confident, fully aware of its position at the top of the food chain. Now we all talked about it at dinner that night and how we experienced a, a sense of admiration mixed with just a little bit of envy. In a way, we longed for that same level of confidence and assuredness that we just sing about in the choir here as we journey through our own life's challenges. And that's exactly what this story of Daniel offers us. Confidence and blessed assurance. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you for your love and your mercy which reigns in our hearts. We thank you for a love so deep and so wide that it can reach every nation of our world. We thank you for the example of your son, Jesus Christ. Hide me behind his cross today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As modern people, we face Many obstacles, though, that may hinder us from fully applying Daniel's example to our own lives. We have talked about that a lot in this series, We Are Lions. As Megan mentioned, the busyness and the distractions. How the demands of work and modern technology and personal commitments occupy our time and our energy. We've also talked about our lack of spiritual disciplines how spiritual practices such as prayer and Bible study and fellowship are necessary to connect with God, to grow spiritually, to, to build the foundation of our faith. Not long ago in a two-week sermon event on end times, we talked about doubt and uncertainty, didn't we? How God's presence and God's plans for our lives are eternal and how the lack of faith of our secular world can erode our confidence in God if we aren't paying close attention to the right things. 
Last week, we talked about the fear of rejection and persecution and how that arises out of societal pressures and cultural norms and how that lulls us into being complicit or pressured. How the world dismisses us Christians as old-fashioned, sometimes even out of touch. Today, though, I want us to lean into a discussion on cultural relativism and moral confusion. Cultural relativism is, in a layman's term, the, the belief that what is considered right or wrong can vary from culture to culture or person to person. It suggests that there are no universal or objective standards on morality. Instead, moral values and ethical judgments are seen as being shaped by culture and cultural norms and beliefs and individual perspectives. That is where moral confusion comes in. You see, cultural relativism can sometimes create moral dilemmas and conflicts when different cultures believe different things and, and those beliefs clash such as issues like human rights and anyone marginalized, refugees, political races. It becomes challenging to determine which perspective should be considered morally correct. Cultural relativism argues that neither culture is inherently right or wrong in that perspective. And each culture's view is seen as valid within its own context and should not be judged or criticized by outsiders who may hold different beliefs or different values. Cultural relativism argues that it is important to understand and respect different cultural practices and perspectives. And that we humans must recognize that what we may consider right or wrong varies across cultures and therefore right or wrong are subjective. They are different from human to human. Here are the challenges. Living in a culture that promotes relativism and embraces shifting moral standards creates confusion and doubt about moral absolutes and the authority of God's word. In a nutshell, confusion undermines our confidence in a living according to God's truth. We cannot live as lions, rulers of God's created world, without confidence in God. I also want to look closely today at the effects of a lack of community and mentoring. You can probably think of a personal situation that you navigated feeling all alone and unsupported. Anybody ever experienced that? You could all most likely remember a time when a community, maybe a community of believers, but certainly mentors, who when they encouraged you and challenged you in your faith or in your life, it was helpful. Anybody experience that? Yeah. Accountability partners are so important because it can be difficult to sustain confidence and trust in God. When we have fellowship and guidance from other Christians around us who help provide accountability and wisdom and the opportunity to learn from their experiences, life can be a whole lot better and more rewarding to live. Our cultural relativism has allowed our morals to become blurred and confused, which is a tactic and a strategy of Satan. See, we live in a world that says that just about everything that is considered right or wrong can vary from place to place or even person to person. For example, eating crickets is gross would be a typical opinion on the streets of the city of Central, am I right? Eating crickets is gross. I would not do that today, not when there's Postelia sitting out in the parking lot. However, eating crickets in Thailand well, that's like having a serve in a Chex Mix over there. Each culture's view is seen as valid within its own context and should not be judged or criticized by outsiders who hold other beliefs and other values. But here, friends, 
is the warning. Crickets and checks mix are not the same thing as Jesus Christ, eternal salvation, and loving others. You cannot apply this concept of cultural relativism across the board for every aspect of life, which is exactly what is happening in our world today. Because the enemy will use it. Use it to confuse you. Use it to create moral dilemmas and conflicts that will paralyze you. Paralyze your faith your actions paralyze you standing up like we talked about last week. God help yours and my unbelief. When we clash on important issues like human rights, fair treatment, and faith, it becomes more challenging to determine which perspective should be considered morally correct. And friends, our dilemma comes when we stop acting and thinking like Christians, many Christs. While cultural relativism emphasizes the importance of understanding and respecting different cultural practices and perspectives, and it has its points when it comes to crickets and checks mix, but when it comes to our morals, our Christian faith must be our compass. It must be. It must be the standard by which we live by. Today, as we conclude our sermon series, We Are Lions, we gather to explore and embrace the fullness of our lion-like faith. We have delved into the remarkable story of Daniel, examining his authority, his prayer life, and his commitment to standing up against injustice and worldly pressures. But today we focus on how he lived with confidence in God. We will consider how we can live as roaring lions. You feeling like a roaring lion this morning? Anybody want to say, roar? (laughs) Nice, I like it. We need to draw inspiration from the faithful and extraordinary example of the life of Daniel. We witnessed in his story a time when the Israelites were in exile in Babylon. Despite their circumstances, Daniel remained steadfast in his devotion to God. He exemplified lion power, walking in authority and confidence, rooted in a strong prayer life. His faithfulness stirred the jealousy of the opposition around him, too. In this specific passage, we witnessed Daniel's unwavering faith as he was thrown into the lion's den by King Darius's minions. However, God miraculously spared him because of Daniel's righteous and blameless life before God. The impact of this event was profound, leading King Darius to proclaim the greatness of Daniel's God, the God of Israel, to all of the citizens of the world, and especially the ones under his rule. That decree that Megan read That's not King Darius quoting somebody else. It's not some ancient hymn. He wrote it. He's not repeating something that's somewhere else in Scripture. It was a proclamation made by King Darius himself of the greatness and sovereignty of the God of Daniel. It was penned by the hand of a humbled earthly king who acknowledged and praised the God of Daniel, affirming God's everlasting kingdom and dominion over all the world. It was a testament to the impact of Daniel's faithfulness, of Daniel's witness, and the power of God's intervention, not only in his own life, but in the lives of an entire kingdom. And as we learn together today, I want you to keep coming back to one question over and over and over in your mind. And it's this, where could you use the power of an intervention by God today? I want you to think about it personally. I want you to think about it as a citizen of our world and of our country. Where could you use the power of an intervention by God today. 
think about the moral issue that the story of Daniel presents. It was the cultural practice of the Medes and the Persians to sign an interdict that could not be changed, and it was used to bring harm to one of God's children. But it was Daniel's faith that kept him praying in obedience to God and resting in the righteousness and in the protection of the Lord. That nation was partially corrupt and they needed an intervention. What part of you is corrupt and needs an intervention? What part of us is corrupt and needs an intervention? Where could you, where could we use the intervention of the power of God? As Christians, we must remember this lesson to be roaring lions, unapologetically walking in God's power with the heart of God and the discipline and the boldness to confront injustice. You want a litmus test for it? What is loving? What is gracious? What does the Bible say? What does the church teach? What is reasonable? What does my mentor and my small group say? And most important, what did Jesus do? As followers of Jesus in the present day, this story continues to speak to us. It reminds us of the importance of living with confidence in God, just as Daniel did. (laughs) Daniel's courage and unwavering faith in the face of adversity serves as a powerful example to you today. And never before have we faced more moral dilemmas than now, thanks to cultural relativism. Consider the conflicting moral message for our youth today who through media, peer pressure, and social societal trends are experiencing and normalizing and even glorifying casual relationships in a hookup culture. In social media, our youth encounter daily messages that portray casual sexual encounters as normal and expected. This wrongly suggests to them that physical pleasure without commitment or emotional connection is not only desirable, but 100% socially acceptable. Amongst their peers, they are often encouraged to engage and even promote such behaviors. Heck, even share pictures of it over their iPhones. Parents and grandparents, our youth feel pressure to conform to these societal expectations in order to fit in or to be accepted. You need to know that. Where are the roaring lions using their voices to teach our young people about the value of commitment in relationships and the honoring of God with their bodies? This isn't complicated, friends. Our moral compasses should be powered by Jesus Christ and used to make choices that align us with our faith and the teaching of God's holy word. We need to raise our youth with the ability to discern the truth and make intentional decisions that reflect their beliefs. This requires them to deepen their understanding of God's word. And unless you are personally going to teach them God's word in all your spare time, then you need to get them to this church and stop prioritizing other less impactful and important things over God's word. Our children and our youth overcoming this crazy, over-sexualized world will require them to seek guidance from trusted mentors and spiritual leaders and surround themselves in a supportive Christian community that shares their values. It will require them to anchor themselves in biblical principles and to rely on God's grace. Because we all need it. We've all made mistakes. All of us messed up. Only then can our youth find strength to resist the the pressures of this surrounding culture and live out their faith in a meaningful way. It's not just the youth struggling and needing an intervention either. 
We as a nation need God's power in an intervention. These very same strategies that I just laid out for our youth will help with American business owners who face pressures to offshore their manufacturing to countries who treat their labor poorly, compromise their safety, exploit their workers, including women and children, just to lower costs so that they can drive their corporate profits up. We need to raise a generation of Christian business owners who know how to maintain integrity and ethical behavior in their daily operations as part of their business strategies. And we personally need an intervention by God's will today as well. We have parents in our community who are more focused on investing and buying their kids $2,000 iPhones in fear of them being shunned by their peers instead of invested in teaching them Christian principles such as gratitude, stewardship, and giving back through service to others and effectively learning to testify to God's goodness through their personal witness. You are important, church. You're important. It's time for you to roar. Our children need you. Our country needs you. I need you. You need each other. It is time for us to embrace our lion-like faith, to stand and to walk in our lion power, and to get on our knees and pray so that we are lion-hearted, to live disciplined lives of prayer, to study our brains out, to fellowship so that we are tamed, and position to roar. (laughs) God puts us here to rule. This means living with confidence, unwavering in our commitment to God, just like Daniel. Our lion-like faith should embolden us to stand firm against injustice, to prioritize God over worldly desires and schemes, and to seek God's guidance through a strong, disciplined life of prayer, study, and fellowship. Ultimately, it calls you and me to embody the image of Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah. Within our United Methodist tradition, we uphold the belief in the transformative power of prayer, don't we, Miss Camille? In fact, it is one of our vows in the moment of baptism and membership. Like Daniel, we recognize that a strong prayer life And knowledge of God nurtures our relationship with God and equips us to face the challenges of this world. We need to be praying for our young people, for each other, for this nation. The story of Daniel aligns with our theology of social justice, urging us to stand up against injustice, even if it means defying societal norms and expectations by fostering a community here at Blackwater that mentors, supports, and encourages one another and centers our life on the word of God, a place that encourages each other, where you and I can overcome obstacles and learn to embrace the fullness of our lion-like faith. We can become roaring lions with an uncompromised moral compass Powered by the north, south, east, and west points of Jesus Christ's cross. Everything on that compass that we need is there. Stretching from east to west. One nail scarred hand to the other. Christians across generations can intentionally cultivate a deep and vibrant relationship with God through consistent prayer, regular study, and active participation in this church, seeking guidance from other mature believers, honest conversations about doubts, insecurities, intentionally aligning our values up with the values of God. That's how we learn confidence. Our diverse, multi-generational congregation has a mission to pass down our faith from generation to generation. The story of Daniel provides us with an invaluable lesson to accomplish that mission by teaching our children, young adults, and new people to the faith about Daniel's unwavering faith, his lion power and boldness in standing up 
We equip them to navigate the challenges of our lifetime and by remaining faithful to God. Embracing a lion-like faith empowers us to be witnesses of God. Inspires us to be loving like Jesus and to follow his guidance. You remember my story about traveling through the dense jungle in the Masai Mara. I imagine us together, friends, at the end of our journey, as we wrap a time where we faced and overcome various obstacles along the way, and we've done it with determination and courage and together. <laughs> And as we reach our final destination, we suddenly hear a thunderous roar reverberating through the pride land of God's kingdom. I imagine we turn towards the roar and we witness the majestic lion standing proudly on a rock. It's sound echoing for miles. It's black water. <laughs> it's a lion, a symbol of power, a symbol of authority, rulers of God's created world, the church. And in that moment, we realize that we have become roaring lions together, transformed through our journey and walking in authority, fully confident in our identity and our purpose. My beloved Blackwater, we are called to be roaring lions in faith. Just as Daniel walked in confidence and authority, prioritizing God over the world, we too can embody that lion-like faith. With God as our strength, we can face any challenge, confront any injustice, and live with unwavering confidence in God's love and guidance. So let you and I go forth, roaring like lions, and change the world. Because we are lions. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know about you, but Daniel's got me fired up. I want to sit around and wait for something to happen. I want to do something in our community and in our world and in my family and in my marriage and in my relationships with others. I don't know about you. But I want to do the thing that God put us here to do, to rule this creation. And that's what this moment is about. This is your discipleship moment. It's about what God has stirred in your heart. It's not about anything I've said. It's not anything what anybody's done. It's about what God is trying to do with you. I want you to ask yourself where you need an intervention. This is your time to respond. It is your time to invite the power of God in your life. Won't you stand as we sing our call to discipleship?
People of God receive this benediction. Let me hear your best roar. Yeah, now go be Blackwater to the world. Amen.